Um, those of you here in person, thank you. It is so nice to be talking to a real audience. Sometimes in Zoom, I'm sure you've all experienced the, the wondering who's really out there listening. So at least I know some people are listening, and a lot of our colleagues have joined us on Zoom today. So this is uh, the state of the school um, in person after two years of doing it virtually. Uh, I always struggle with how much ground I would like to cover versus what I can actually cover, because this School of Medicine is just extraordinary in so many ways. So I want to start by saying thank you, and I will end by saying thank you to all of you for everything that you do to make this school what it is, and it really is truly extraordinary. So to start, I want to honor those among our faculty, some long retired and some, unfortunately, very early in their careers that passed away this year. All will be missed. So just a moment of silence, please. And of course, this represents um, many more that we might not have been notified of. Um, I can honestly say I've known all of them, and so it really does tug at your heart in so many ways. So moving on to the state of the school, I want to remind myself and everybody our two guiding principles leading the School of Medicine. The one is the concept of one Duke, which has metastasized. I mean, it comes up in almost every conversation. Very simple concept that the more we work together and really leverage across all of the talents and incredible assets of Duke as a major world-class institution, the better we all will be. And the other is the concept of service. These leadership roles are really about service. It's not about an individual. Um, it is about the faculty, the staff, and the students that we serve. Because again, that's the major asset that a place like Duke really has. So with that in mind, um, here's the school in review this year. First of all, no doubt a transformative year. We continue to learn from COVID. We continue to learn both how to live with this new disease, but also continue to learn from the innovations that have occurred by force in the last two years. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But the real transformation is the joint commitment to create a new faculty practice called the Duke Health Integrated Practice. This is really about one Duke. This is how we break down barriers, create a practice that will be world class in terms of its patient-centered care, and we'll talk about that a bit more. We did launch the School of Medicine's first strategic plan around equity, diversity, and inclusion after a year of comprehensive self-study and planning. And then the Duke Science and Technology Initiative, which started three years ago, has really picked up steam. So we'll talk a little bit about that and really uh, based on a very historic uh, gift from the Duke Endowment. So what about it, COVID innovations? We have seen it across all missions. Certainly our testing surveillance program you all know about um, that's finally been downsized uh, but was just extraordinary both in its breadth and the ability of an institution to work together to keep each other safe. Laboratory research, incredible innovation. Shut everything down within two weeks, got it all back up and going within six weeks, and the engine has been on full steam since then. Clinical research, uh, we did things faster than we could ever imagine doing things in the past. Patient care, we, like many of our top academic uh, hospitals and health systems in the country, took care of the sickest, innovating on the run as we were taking care of those sick patients. I'm very proud of community engagement. This has been an area where I think we really upped our game and really became partners in our community to help keep Durham and the university safe. Education, we saw the, the wonders of virtual uh, teaching and learning and vaccinations. I mean, we, we benefited from all of the research that has occurred at our top institutions to see vaccines come online within a year of this new pathogen. So if I look at the lessons learned, these are kind of my, my, my uh, take homes. The first is to me, the COVID experience really has reinforced why we exist. Why do we need these very, very expensive academic medical schools? Well, if you look at the missions of AMCs, 
they were instrumental in getting through this public health crisis, and they will be instrumental in the future public health crisis. Why? Because we care for all patients, and we had to do that through the, the pandemic. Our discovery commitment um, was critical to standing up basic and clinical research. Healthcare policy and reform. We had faculty working at the local, state, and national levels around the clock to help bring up new policies around testing, vaccination, uh, with our expertise very much at the forefront. Educating new generations of scientists and healthcare providers. We, we did that all through the pandemic. Very proud of the fact that none of our, our health professional students had delayed gra graduation because we were able to rapidly pivot to achieving the same goals for education, but not necessarily doing it all in the same way. And as I said, really becoming community partners. The other thing we learned is we can do things faster, more efficiently, with extraordinary collaboration. And it really highlighted the urgency to continue examining the root cause and change health disparity trajectory in this country. We need to do it. COVID taught us once again it is a huge issue. The one other area that I found most disturbing was the misinformation, disinformation, and distrust of science. That led to at least 300,000 unnecessary deaths in this country because of failure to take vaccines or fa failure to seek health in denying that this was a life-threatening disease. We have to embrace the challenge of becoming better communicators of science in our families, in our communities, and in the national setting. And we must continue to work on provider burnout. One of the extraordinary aspects of the pandemic has been the sheer duration. None of us have ever had to experience a crisis that went on for as long as this crisis did, and absolutely highlighted the challenge of burnout in providers, and we must continue to work on that. Our research engine, as I said, was on full steam, and, and it still is. And some of the highlights I just want to talk a little bit about, one is being one of the institutions leading in the development of a pan-coronavirus vaccine. It has become obvious, as we've dealt with variant after variant, that whether it's a SARS-CoV-2 pan vaccine or it's a broader pan-coronavirus vaccine, this is really the way out of the dilemma that we've been in, and so proud of the Vaccine Institute that has one of the lead candidates that has been tested already in animals. The work in DCRI has been extraordinary. If you just look at prevention, testing, treatment, DCRI is one of the major coordinating centers across the spectrum of research and continues to be around COVID, whether it's looking at old drugs and repurposing them, looking at new drugs, and rapidly moving them through the, the clinical uh, trials, or just understanding the complexities of testing in communities across the country. So very, very proud of the work that, that Duke has been able to do in advancing our understanding of how to best both intervene and move science forward, particularly in such a crisis. So as I mentioned, the, the real, I think, uh, if I had to choose one, transformative change this year, it was moving towards a, a Duke Health integrated practice. It is historic. Um, it changes a structure that has been in existence for 90 years, but it really looks to the future where we can implement a unified strategic plan, where we can really provide an exceptional patient experience that is not encumbered by boundaries between uh, for-profit practice and a non-for-profit health system, that we can pay very competitive compensation to our providers. And that sustains and supports the academic mission. Many times through the last year and a half, people would ask me, well, why does the dean care about this? I care deeply about this, not only that I think it is absolutely the right thing for patient care, but I know that we need a successful health system to be a successful school of medicine. It's not only about finances, it's about how we really integrate our missions, particularly in patient care. And that in the future, looking down the road, we really have to deliver on high value care. And to do that, we have to work together with our providers to provide the highest value, best quality care, and that will be judged 
by our payers. So for many, many reasons, it's really exciting, but probably the most exciting part of this was it really was a consensus. And it's so much easier to move forward in change when there's an enthusiasm and support. And so this was a vote, 95% of the, the members voted. I think number, number one, that is really great. Um, and 75% of those that voted, voted for change. So that sets a really good starting point to work together to create an integrated practice. Lots of work to do here. This kind of outlines the work streams that will be engaging leadership across the health system and practice. I won't go into it in too much detail, but just remind us that culture and our work around equity, diversity, and inclusion is across all of our working groups. So really exciting. Um, for those in the basic science realm, I'm not sure you know what this all means. Um, but it's basically how we are, are coming together as a single organization to really plan ahead, as opposed to trying to work with somebody that's a distant relative in some ways. And so I think this is really very important for our future. Now, we did start Science and Technology Initiative two, three years ago, but we were very, very fortunate for the Duke Endowment to deliver on a second gift for a total of $100 million going to the university, shared with our partners on campus to support the Science and Technology Initiative. It's the largest award that we've gotten from the endowment, and it really does form the basis for our DST recruitment, retention, and support of science, but it's not limited to that. And DST will continue to be a focus for a major philanthropic campaign that we'll be talking a lot about in the next year. In terms of the broader science and technology initiative across campus, there are three major areas. All of them are relevant to the School of Medicine. So resilience, that is a concept that we came up with to be inclusive of our broad base of science. And so biologic resilience can be applied to a molecule, a cell, a human body, um, a system, a community. But it is the idea that we really start getting at the basis, basics of, of uh, a system or a cell that's disturbed and how it either recovers or does not recover. And so it turned out actually we had a hard time selling this initially to uh, some of our, I guess, less scientific board members, but it really has taken it on its own life because I think it really resonates with almost all the areas of research. And I think that's really important because if you ask me today, what's the most important area of research? Pretty, pretty good idea that I'd be wrong because many of our discoveries, we cannot predict where they will start. And yet they may be the answer to Alzheimer's disease, so I like keeping it broad. Material science, sounds like it's mostly engineering. It's a, it's a great area for us because it is the intersection between engineering and medicine and computing. I mean, we all know that data science and high throughput computing is incredibly important to all the work that we do. So I'm really excited that the whole campaign and the whole science and technology is so relevant to the School of Medicine. Now, Part of being able to really attract and retain great scientists is having distinguished professorships to support them. And thanks to Gene Washington, our chancellor, my partner, his vision and commitment, we were able to set up a new set of distinguished professorships. These are the chancellor's distinguished professorships. And our first recipient will be Bob Lefkowitz. So why? I'm sure you're all thinking, well, you know, he's Howard Hughes. He's the, Bob is the father and the grandfather of the Duke Science and Technology Initiative. You can go back to probably three university presidents where he was in their office, constantly making the case that for Duke to be a top institution, we must invest in science, and it's expensive. But finally, he had receptive ears uh, in Vince Price, in Gene Washington, and certainly in my, myself, and so DST became a reality, and so it is fitting that Bob will transfer from being a J.B. Duke professor to the first Chancellor's Distinguished Professorship. So thank you, Jean, for that incredible foresight. Now, um, our Moments to Movement strategic plan, as I said, a year in planning, and then this past year we started to implement. It's got lots of components. Um, just to remind you, it's about culture. It's about retaining and recruiting outstanding talent. 
It's about educating our workforce to really understand the underpinnings of being an organization where everybody has a sense of belonging. It's about developing an anti-racist, equity-centered, and community-engaged research platform that Ebony has led. And it's about re reorienting our leadership, myself included, for our skills in this domain as well. And so to that end, a lot has been going on. We started uh, with the naming of our first vice dean for equity, diversity, inclusion, Kevin Thomas, who is here today. He took over um, with the roadmap and framework in the strategic plan. He's also started to really organize um, our, our skills centrally for developing platforms so we can really measure success in many areas where we just still haven't had the data platforms to do that. We started an initiative with the, our med ed colleagues about reimagining student affairs course, student affairs support, because a lot of the work that came out of the, the strategic plan from the student side really, really addressed areas that we needed to think about in terms of how we support the diverse student body that we have across health professions here. We, have a, we were one of the first schools in the country to have a Determinants of Health Disparities course, and that is going through a major review and revision as these courses are across the country, as we become much more sophisticated and aware of the dynamics of these courses, both for the faculty and for the students. We set up a staff employee resource group, uh, ME Squared, in Ebony, uh, through the, particularly now through the resubmission of the CTSI, set up the Center for Equity in Research, which was launched before the resubmission, but is going to be a cornerstone of the resubmission, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then leadership, myself included, have really immersed ourselves in inclusive excellence training so that we can be the leaders to really support all these efforts. One of the, I used to talk about, um, this process is being a rewiring process, where we really needed to look at everything that we do and say, maybe we need to change it from the bottom up. So one of those areas is APT. Jimmy Chang, who leads our APT committee, took that document, went through all, I don't know, hundreds of pages of it, and took out every piece that mapped to the APT process and really developed a framework driven by the strategic plan that creates a new uh, recognition of scholarship in the area of justice, equity, diversity, anti-racism, inclusion, JEDI. I think this will become a framework for the country. Uh, really, it starts to articulate how we recognize scholarship and accomplishments in this area and how that information is used by our APT committees. It's to be adopted uh, June 30th. Better representation at all ranks in our APT committees with very, very intentional training of committee members, ongoing analytics to track time to rank and, and progress through the ranks. We never had a comprehensive data dashboard to really do that, and a commitment to greater transparency in how the whole APT process works. You know, if you're very connected, you, you might know, but if you're not very connected, it's really confusing. So lots of great work there. Now, as always, we've had some new senior leadership uh, recruitments. Uh, just to give you a few, uh, Jen Averett, who I had the pleasure of working in the Department of Medicine, is now the Associate Dean for Medical Education. Christopher Beyer uh, comes, uh, I think, July 1 to be the new director of the Global Health Institute from Johns Hopkins. Great recruit. Jerry Grant, who I believe is here, is our new chair of neurosurgery. He's coming back to Duke, having been here before and then going to Stanford. Michael James is a, a, I think he's a faculty member at Anesthesiology, is the new assistant vice chancellor for the Duke NUS research. And of course, Kevin, our new vice dean. And then Lisa Verani is the new associate dean for planning and chief of staff, who took over for Stacey Palmer. We also had changeover in advisory deans. Now, we have not had changeover in advisory deans for many, many years because they were quite good. Um, in fact, Carolyn Haynes and Bob Drecker are retiring, so they're, they're actually moving on to a different phase of their professional lives, but gave years of service with three really new, exciting um, advisory deans. Amy Chung and Ed Buckley shared with me the only 
Problem with that is you can't both be an advisor and an educator. It creates a bit of a conflict because you're, you're judging students, and she, on multiple years, ach achieved the top teaching award. So, you know, it's a trade-off. David Gordon, Del Wickfield will, will continue. Leonore Corsino was appointed about two years ago. She's relatively new. And Joe Jackson, and he's also the new director of the Office for Student Affairs. They'll be working with this Reimagining Student Support Committee to really revise all the aspects of how we support our students. This is an area that I always get in trouble because there's just too much to go through, so I'm just going to highlight a few. You know, one of the highest measurements of excellence of our faculty is how well they compete for Howard Hughes, and this year we had two. They're amazing individuals. By the way, I'm going to go through these pretty fast, so names, pictures will be here. But so proud that, that we had two faculty that were accepted into Howard Hughes this year. The academies are also a, a measurement of our success. We had new a new member of National Academy of Medicine, National Academy of Science, Acad Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Pew Scholar. The ELAM program, I am a proud ELAM of uh, many, many years ago, but that is the training program for emerging leaders in medicine, and we always love to uh, sponsor our, our emerging leaders in that program. And there's a new parallel program of emerging leaders in hospital administration, and Becky Smith will be participating in that program. And Jean recognized Gloria Bass to receive the Susan B. Clark Administrative Leadership Award. She has spent 41 years of her, her career here. Just extraordinary. We had 16 faculty recognized as distinguished professors. Just a little more information about that. Working with our finance group, who are just exceptionally uh, talented, we were able to create 27 new professorships this year because the investment pool had done so well, many of our professorships were now in the 10 to 12 to $14 million range. And so we worked with our chairs and aggressively split them so we could really give distinguished chairs to the many faculty that deserve them. That is a 20% increase in one year. So hats off to my finance partners and development partners that really made this happen. Now this is one of the new professorships that touches me very personally. I had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Quarry. He was the first black surgeon at Duke. And you can imagine that wasn't an easy road. And so we have created an endowed professorship, a junior endowed professorship in his honor. And Dr. Lisa McElroy is the first recipient. I'm proud of this in many ways. It, it does represent a recognition of our commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion as a scholarship and as a recognition of accomplishment in individuals. But it also was a great way to engage our emerging faculty. This is a junior faculty professorship, and I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of creating these opportunities for our junior faculty, and we had great nominations, and the Office of Physician Science De Development had a rigorous, transparent review, so this is an exciting new professorship. We have four new recipients of the Physician Scientist Strong Start Award. As you might recall, this is a significant um, competitive opportunity to support, again, early phase um, physician scientists. Now, one of the most coveted faculty awards and staff awards is the Michelle Wynn Inclusive Excellence Award. And I also had the pleasure of, of knowing Michelle Wynn through her career. And the, the recipients are recognized for exemplary achievements and contributions towards inclusive excellence by means of service, leadership, research, and education. This award has rapidly become one of the most coveted awards that we give each year. Another measurement of our success is how many of our faculty are getting into honorific societies like the Association of American Physicians, the older group, and the American Society of Clinical Investigation, the relatively younger group, and we're so proud that we have year-to-year -year great um, new members of those um, national um, societies. One interesting uh, recognition this year was that we had seven members of our Vaccine Institute recognized in an international uh, award that is out of Portugal that really recognizes a biomedical 
uh, work that is exceptional in quality and scientific relevance. Now, the reason that our Vaccine Institute members were recognized is they participated in the first clinical validation of mRNA-based vaccine. It was for Zika. But obviously, this, as many years of research, this is one of the areas that really led the way to, the, to being able to roll out an RNA vaccine for COVID in the speed that it did. And then two of our faculty have been recognized by our state. And this, this is really important for us to be partners and to have our state level recognition. And so Viviana Martinez Bianchi, as many of you know, she was one of the several faculty and staff that were very, very active in Latin 19 initiatives, the advocacy group. And then Blake Wilson received the Lasker Award for cochlear implants. And through the last couple of years, he's been leading a Lancet um, initiative to look at world hearing loss and really plan a, a global strategy for, for approaching hearing loss internationally. So proud of our North Carolina awardees. Of course, PhD students, near and dear to our heart, the, one of the, the measurements of their excellence is receiving NSF graduate research fellowships. Now, the Duke Presidential Awards are the highest honor that the university bestows on either individuals or groups, and we kind of really dominated the awards this year, many because of the work that was done through COVID-19. The teams, medical intensive care unit, the active three clinical research team, and of course, the employee occupational health and wellness COVID response team. I don't think I have to tell you why all of those individuals were recognized. They have been working tirelessly for two years and well deserved the recognition. We also had individuals, Maureen Collins. She was recognized for many, many years of work that she has done supporting our diverse students through the Multicultural Resource Center. And Gita Swami for the work that she has done really elevating our focus on scientific integrity. Now, I put up this just to remind everybody, you know, that one of the most discouraging things to hear as a dean is, I didn't know. I didn't know that we had that opportunity. It just, just gives you a snapshot of the programs that are available to faculty. So whether you're a chair sitting here or you're a faculty member wanting to know what's available, just to go through quickly. Advance Up is a, a program that Ann Brown created with Kevin Thomas to really focus on the early experience of underrepresented racial and ethnic faculty to really give, give those individuals a community and support as they were launching their careers. ALICE is a leadership development program for mid-career women. Um, Duke Clinical Le Leadership Program is a leadership program for emerging clinical leaders. So, and then LEADER is a program for emerging scientists that are gonna lead in their lab. So that portfolio really starts to give you an idea of the leadership development that's available for you and for your faculty. The bridge funding program, I think, is extraordinary. I didn't start it, but I certainly continued it. Um, that is a program that we offer throughout the year to support faculty with a lapse in grant support with the idea that it costs us a lot less to bridge than it does to have faculty have to downsize their labs then bring them back up when they are successful renewing their funding. Last year, there was $840,000 given to 10 faculty. Um, the Office of Research Mentoring, another resource. And then the Fund to, to Retain Clinical Scientists. Again, I'm not sure if anybody knows this, but that's a collaboration between the Dean's Office, the Doris Duke Foundation, and the American Heart Association that provides resource opportunities for an early faculty member that are really struggling to make their, their careers and their work here at Duke and their work at home come all together. So this is just a reminder that there's a lot there for everybody to tap into, and it's frustrating when we hear, I didn't know. So now you know. Okay, milestones. Um, you know, the, ra the rankings we hate to, to focus on too much. This is the one that I like the most. It cannot be manipulated. It's the Blue Ridge uh, ranking of NIH funding, and I think this is just extraordinary. We are by no means the largest medical school in this country, probably mid to small in terms of size, 
but we are ranked third in NIH funding. And that is just, I think, a strong indication of the passion and commitment of our faculty. Two basic science departments and, and, and eight clinical departments were ranked in the top 10. Again, extraordinary. It shows the breadth, the depth, and really how driven our faculty are to, to really do successful, impactful research. Now, the other ranking that we love to hate is, is our um, US News and World Report ranking. We're ranked six this year. Last year, we were three. I am not worried about that at all. Between, between two and six are three tied. So you, that, that just gives you an idea that we're all pretty packed in there. Um, and I think as long as we stay among the top, I'm certainly happy with that. And we should be very proud of it. Again, seven specialty programs in the school were in the top 10. So we like it when it works out, but there's a lot of flaws to this ranking. So other things that we did, I just want to go back here. OK. Now I want to talk about some of the things that we have really launched in the last year or so. One is Duke Research and Discovery at RTP. For those that don't know it, that is a new campus that we opened in June of 2021. Um, largely driven by the success of our faculty in getting grants where we no longer had the space to really accommodate them, and that was in this massive trifecta of influenza uh, vaccine grants. And so we did uh, explore and then settled on a campus in the Research Triangle. It has researchers from DHVI, Surgery, Immunology, and MGM. It has both a clinical trial center. It's really cool because you can drive in. It's pretty easy access as well as a lot of laboratory space. It had been occupied by industry, so it's well out outfitted. But the other exciting part of this campus is it's no longer big pharma. It's biotechnology. So it's a great environment to start building bridges with some of the newer biotech companies that are coming in. Um, there's a new vivarium facility. Thank goodness we were running out of mouse space. Uh, square footage costs for a mice is about the same as a New York apartment. It's really, really expensive. Um, the idea of a new building to house mice is, you know, well north of $200 million. So this was a great compromise, being able to take over space and build out some of the vivarium needs there. We'll need that new building eventually, but it gives us a few more years. I love the work that's been going on in med ed. I think, as I mentioned, probably a year or so ago. This is not an area that, that I was deeply engaged in, and certainly not the nuances of some of the changes in medical education. Asked Ed Buckley to really ask a question of his med ed leaders a couple of years ago, are we preparing physicians for the future? What do they need in 10 years? They came up with the most amazing plan of what's called the patient first curriculum. Now they're implementing it, and it's just, it's just wonderful. So the first is immersion in medicine. Every one of you in the audience that went to medical school, I'm sure had the same complaint. You don't see a patient until at least the second year, if not the third year. You really start wondering why, why you're at medical school. First two weeks that students arrive here, they have a total immersion in a patient experience. And that starts to frame everything from the basic science they're learning to getting them ready for their clerkships. Huge success. The, the other complaint, and it's, it's generational, it, it crosses generations, I should say, is really understanding the relevance of the massive amount of basic science that we learn. And so the launch of Foundations Patient Care 1 and 2 is integrating much closer the biomedical science with patient care. And if I just put it simply, because that's how I need things explained to me, if you come in with shortness of breath, this approach goes from shortness of breath all the way down to basic physiology of gas exchange and starts connecting the relationship between a patient complaint and the basic science. It's a lot of work to build this, but the work they've done is just extraordinary. I love the fact that they, we are now teaching a medical Spanish course. This is really important. For, particularly for our community, but almost anywhere that our physicians practice in this country. Data science is critical to any doctor training now, whether they're going to be practicing in a big uh, independent practice or they're going to be in a health system or they're going to do research. Um, there's also a longitudinal ambulatory 
clinical experience. So the, the, the old model is you see a patient once and you never see them again. You never know what happens. The new model is at least you have some longitudinal experience with a single patient. So I love what the med ed folks have done with our curriculum. We did stand up a new health professions program this year, the occupational therapy program. It overshot. It was too successful. Uh, many more uh, students decided to accept admissions here than we had planned for, but that's good. Um, it's 40 students in the first cohort, 45 in the second, already recruited outstanding faculty. So this program has really hit the ground running. And then we all, many of us participated in the celebration of the 50th anniversary of our designation as an NIH Comprehensive Cancer Center, and lots of activity this year to celebrate um, that milestone. And then DCRI celebrated its 25th anniversary. Now, they wanted it in person, but like everything with COVID, um, it was supposed to be last fall, and we all know what happened there. Um, but D DCRI is extraordinary. It was founded in 1996. It is remains and has been the world's largest academic clinical research organization. When I've talked to my colleagues in other organizations, they simply say, we cannot do that. It would be a billion dollar endeavor to recreate that. And uh, I can tell, tell you under Adrian Hernandez's leadership, it is thriving and has really you know, taken up the lead with COVID, but in so many other areas. Another thing I'm incredibly proud of is the fact that this year we received we, an NIH-established Alzheimer's Disease uh, Research Center grant. We had one many years ago, and we lost it, and it's really hard to get back in this game. And the leadership of Heather Whitson and so many of our neuroscience leaders, they got together and developed a strategy, Rich O'Brien, Steve Lisberger, to partner with UNC. This is a simple concept. There's no rules that say you cannot partner with UNC. There, there aren't, I can just tell you. And this was an extraordinarily successful partnership because we got funded in the first attempt, which was the other thing. We, we actually had reviewers come here two, three years ago to kind of inform you know, our path forward, and they were like, oh, it's gonna take five to eight years. You'll probably have to go in two or three times. I'm like, eh, well, I don't think so. Um, they got it the first time, and, and it is so exciting. The approach is very different. They are creating a longitudinal cohort, um, particularly informed by families at risk, to try to really look at early stages in Alzheimer's. So lots of, I'm sure, exciting research to come from that. Uh, Ebony led a complete revamping of our CTSA, um, NIH, in their constant need to change. Um, had changed the application process. It's not now five applications, which is just a nightmare because they all come up for renewal at a different time. But what Ebony did is really focus on development of a workforce that really in, is embedded, embedded with the concepts of health equity. So the workforce and clinical trials being trained, working in the community with an incredibly strong partnership with NCCU. In fact, NCCU is our partner. Not a second level partner, the partner on this submission. So I have no doubt we're going to be successful with this resubmission. I think it's so exciting. I got the debrief from our external advisory board that was in about six months before it went in, and they said there isn't an institution in the country that's as forward thinking as this CT CTSA. So I'm very proud of this. Um, Many of you probably saw in the news that through both 30 years of research and happenstance, um, we gave the first heart and thymus transplant to a young baby. Um, why is this exciting? Number of reasons. First of all, thymic transplant was not a reality until last year, but it was based on 30 plus years of research here at Duke. Louise Markert, starting off actually with Bart Haynes, developed the whole technology to do thymic transplants, and then there was a need for a heart transplant. And the beauty of this is really asking the question of whether there will, there will be less rejection, if any rejection, in this double thymic and heart transplant. And Alan can probably tell me what he's going to bet on that. But th this was an extraordinary opportunity. And I think it's emblematic of Duke. You know, we've, we've, we had these different areas of expertise the opportunity came to us, 
and really made, they made it happen. And so I, I think these stories are what define us. In terms of philanthropy, um, this is an area that we are really going to be focusing the next couple of years. There is the silent phase of a capital campaign going on. You're going to hear a lot more about it in the next two years. Um, it's both campus and Duke Health. And just a couple of things that are, I think you need to know. First of all, it is Duke Health. It's not just the School of Medicine. And in fact, we really think that partnering uh, much more intentionally will be much more successful. Um, it's ambitious to the tune of several billion, and we haven't kind of done the final math to put a number on that, and it's really exciting. But philanthropy is incredibly important to our success. Each year, we do better than we thought, and we're online to have a very good year. It's hard to do better than last year because we had that amazing uh, $30 million scholarship gift, but um, every year uh, we find new partners that, that are very excited about what we do here. So you're going to be hearing a lot more about philanthropy. Now, one of the areas that you are going to be hearing a lot more is really looking at our Grateful Patient Program, and particularly those of you that run clinical programs. How can we better partner with our Grateful Patients to make sure they know how it is that we do the great things that we do here and, and really become partners in supporting some of that work? So what are our priorities for the future? Um, you know. Every day, I, it, it seems like we have a new priority, and I think uh, Dr. Washington and myself, we're trying to be much more uh, thoughtful about, about narrowing our priorities. Um, so when I think of the school, certainly the building out of the new integrated practice, uh, that is a priority that I think we've all committed to. Continuing the implementation of our equity, diversity, inclusion strategic plan, this will not happen in one year, two years, three years, but it needs to keep going forward. Um, beginning to build on the foundation of our science and technology initiative. And then the other area is focusing on building a culture of wellness, professionalism, respect, and scientific accountability. That sounds like a lot, but we've done a lot of work in this space. Certainly Gita Swami's leading on the scientific accountability, uh, Ann Brown's leading on professionalism. Uh, the culture of wellness is one that I think we all have to embrace. There is not an easy solution to this. In the last couple of weeks, I've been interviewing the candidates for the new vice dean of faculty, because Ann Brown is retiring from that full job. Um, you know, and, and I asked them, you know, how can we move the needle? There, there isn't a magic answer. If there were, every health system in the country would be doing it. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be intentional. And so I'm really interested in people's ideas. Because as we know, the last two years really took a toll on an already, uh, in, I would say, an already stressed workforce with early signs of disengagement. But COVID certainly brought that out. So that's an area that I think we should take our incredible ex expertise and apply it and try things, but also make sure we measure, because you can do a lot in this space, and it might not move the needle. But I just bring that to all of your attention, because I think together we can come up with, I think, some exciting ideas here. And with that, I will stop, and I'd love to answer questions. Thank you. So crystal clear. Jean. I'd like to start with, actually with your last bullet around culture. Uh, just share with us how you began to think about approaching that over the next year. Yeah, so a couple of aspects. First of all, we have to be able to measure something. And I think we've got that part down uh, through work that Rhonda's done and certainly work um, through the campus-wide surveys. Um, so that's a starting point. There's many, many aspects to culture. And some of the things I articulate in that bullet, scientific integrity is part of our culture. Um, how we support and value each other is part of our culture. You know, how we recognize 
people, part of our culture. How do we put that all together? And again, I'm drawing from my interviews of the candidates. I loved the way they all put it, which is really figuring out how do we show our staff, our faculty, that we value them. And, you know, that sounds kind of light, but it's in everything that we do, whether it's so staff awards is an area I've been thinking a lot about. How do we recognize our staff? Well, we don't make as much of the awards, so building up a whole recognition program for our staff. How can we be more intentional at the low, you know, division level down to our faculty to make sure we do recognize accomplishments that aren't necessarily in this long list of awards. So I think there's a lot of aspects to it, and I think we have to attack it from all those different directions. I think we've made some, some movement. I think the scientific integrity work has been extraordinary, but we have a, a long way to go in some of the other aspects of culture. Our DEI work, um, or EDI, sorry, Kevin, um, is another area. So I, I think there are many aspects. I don't think that one you know, is separate from the other. So I think we have to have a multi-pronged approach. Yes. Heather, yes. So I'll, I'll stay on the culture team, but particularly if you could talk about how we do this, um, how we, I, I really agree with, um, you know, the culture feels a little great at the seams um, over the past two years. And as you know, I believe in resilience, so it doesn't mean you never get knocked down, it just means we can bounce back, and I know we will. But what are your thoughts about how to do that in this environment that's hybrid? So I, I, have, I, I suspect we've got a larger crowd in this talk as I've ever had on Zoom, but a smaller crowd in the room. How do we Yeah, great question. Actually, that was one of the themes that we talked a little bit about our senior leadership group is so we're in this hybrid world right now. You know, we're gonna really have to be thinking about that relative to our culture. You know, in many ways it offers flexibility, which I think is great, but I worry that there's a whole bunch of people that are invisible on Zoom. And, you know, I think that is not a very positive move. So I, again, I'll be working with all of you to think very intentionally about our policies around being a hybrid workplace, because I do think that there'll be some unintended negative consequences, and we may lose some really important engagement of people that way. Um, but I know we have to, we wanna be competitive, we have to be flexible, so I think we're gonna have to actually start tackling that. We've kind of been able to push it down the road with each surge, <laughs> it kind of gets, gets uh, pushed back a bit, but we are gonna have to intentionally Start working on that. Well, I love seeing everybody, and uh, thank you all again. I said I'd end with thanking you. Yeah. Of course, I want to end with a comment. I just want to publicly acknowledge uh, our, our dean. Uh, she's got an exceptional uh, leader for the school, but importantly, I see her. Uh, up close as she uh, has also been a leader across the university. And certainly uh, uh, an exceptional partner when it comes to a uh, Duke help. Uh, she does help, you know, the official role of being uh, a, a, a vice chancellor for health affairs and believe me, she uh, carries out that role uh, in an exemplary fashion. So I'm just going to ask you all to join me again in, in recognizing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, thank you all, and hopefully we will start getting together in person more. Um, and again, I look to you to help guide that uh, as you know we plan for the next academic year. Thank you.